Now in that last example, we never actually saw how good our approximation was because we never actually figured out the probability using the proper binomial techniques, which would have given it, us the exact answer. So now with this example, let's do it both ways and see how good the approximation is. Now we're tossing this coin 20 times, so n is fairly high, but not astronomically high. And we're according the number of heads. Find the probability of getting 12 or more heads using the binomial distribution and using an approximation based on the normal distribution. So the expansion that we want to consider is half plus a half to the power of 20 because we've got the chance of success, the chance of failure, and 20 trials. So any one term is going to be 20 choose r, a half to the power of r, a half to the power of 20 minus r. So what's going to happen here, because the chance of success and failure is exactly the same, is that we're going to end up with um, a term here that we can simplify. We're actually going to have half to the power of 20 in every single term. You'll see that as we go along, and we'll be able to take a little shortcut as we go. So we want the probability of 12 or more heads. Now we'll need to add some things up here. That means we've got the probability of getting exactly 12 heads, plus the probability of 13 heads, etc., etc., all the way up to the probability of all 20 heads, which of course is going to be quite unlikely. So for each term, for this one we'd have 20 choose 12, we'd have a half to the power of 12 but we'd also have a half to the power of eight. Can you see what's happening there? We can add the powers together and say, actually, let's just cut to the chase and say it's half to the power of 20. For the next term, we'd have 20 choose 13 and see what would happen if we had half to the 13, but we also had half to the power of seven. We're gonna get half to the power of 20 again. So let's tidy up and just write it that way. And we're gonna continue this pattern all the way up to 20 choose 20. And it's also gonna be half to the power of 20. So if we take half to the power of 20 out the front, that really simplifies the calculation. Now, this is only going to happen when the chance of success and failure is equal. Inside our brackets, we're going to have 20 choose 12, plus 20 choose 13, plus 20 choose 14, etc., etc., all the way up to 20 choose 20. So that's not a crazy calculation to make. Now, when we put this into our calculator, this part here, which I've just done, is 2. 263950, the calculator was able to do that. And I've got 1 to the power of 20, well that's 1. The whole thing is over 2 to the power of 20, so let's finish it off. And our calculator says it's roughly 0 0.252 to three decimal places. Okay, so we've done it with the first method. All right, let's have a look at the second method now. Now we're using an approximation based on the normal distribution and the really important thing to note is that this is discrete data. We've got individual terms and the normal distribution is based on continuous data. So if we just think what would happen if we graphed the actual binomial distribution, we've got all the numbers from 0 to 20 and there's actually a bunch of scores that might happen, right? And we looked at these. We don't join them up to make a smooth line. These are probabilities because it's not a smooth line, it's not continuous data, they're individual data points. And actually we could draw columns here and see that these dots are just the tops of the columns making our polygon. Okay, so we've got dots at the top there. We've got individual things that could happen. So when we say, all right, let's have a look at where 12 is and we want the probability that it's greater than that, Using the normal distribution, we're thinking of a smooth, t uh, a smooth line here and finding the probability of being in this part of the tail. So we could find the probability that z is less than whatever this z score is and then subtract it from one to get the upper tail. The problem that's going to come about though is that if we draw a line straight up from 12 and it hits the top of our ogive, which is our polygon, then we've got to consider that this column here actually goes from 12 and a half to sorry, 11 and a half to 12 and a half, and it actually has a little bit of width. So what we really want is the chance that we are anything from 11 and a half onwards, sorry, the chance that X is greater than or equal to 11 and a half. Now, why 11 and a half? We're approximating based on using a continuous distribution, even though we don't have continuous data. And that approximation with the z-scores is going to be based on the middle of this column. But the problem is everything even 
to half a unit to the side of that column is still a score that we want. 12 has some width to it, okay? So we actually need to go a little bit to one side and take everything from there up. And we call that a continuity correction, the fact that we need to use 11.5 instead of 12. And you need to understand why that happens. It's because each column actually has width. The 12 column has width. And we can't just take from 12 onwards because we'd be missing half of the 12 scores, if that makes sense. So we actually want to consider that before we start. Imagine what the um, histogram and polygon would look like for a given example, and then consider whether you need to go perhaps half a score higher or lower, depending on which side of the tail you're interested in. We want the probability that x is greater than or equal to 11.5. So we're going to need to consider what 11.5 is as a Z score. So we want the probability that Z is greater than or equal to. Now, how do we find a Z score? We say how far above or below the mean is that? Now, what's the mean when we're looking at this experiment? Well, we can easily figure it out. Let's do it on the side. The mean is just N times P, which in this case is 20 times a half, which is 10. So we've got that. And then the standard deviation is the square root of NPQ, which in this case is the square root of 20 times a half times a half. So we've got a quarter of 20, which is 5, so it's going to be root 5. So to find this as a Z score, we need to say, all right, Z is equal to 11.5, subtract the mean, that tells you how far above or below the mean it is, 1.5. And then we need to divide that by root 5, that will be our z-score. So figuring that out, we need 1.5 divided by root 5. And our z-score to two decimal places is 0 0.67. So in other words, we need to find the probability that z is greater than 0 0.67. Now that is equal to 1 minus the probability that z is less than or equal to 0 0.67. And the reason I've just changed that around is because on my z-score table, it gives me the probability that a certain score is to the left of something. So if I want to know how big this top tail is, I need to do 1 minus the probability of being in the bottom tail. And I get 1 minus 0 0.7486, which means that my actual probability is roughly, now remember this is an approximation, 2514. Now, by its nature, this is an approximation. Whether I've rounded this off or not, or use a z-score table that's rounded off, it's an approximation because I've approximated this whole distribution to be normal. And it's not normal, it's binomial. But it's pretty close because n is quite large. And the answer that I've come up with here, 0.2514, and the answer I came up with when I worked it out so-called exactly, 252, I can say with both cases here, I've got a 25% chance of this happening. And you can see how close these are. They're really close enough. By the time you round it off to the nearest percentage, um, they're, they're as good as the same. Now, how do you know when it's okay to approximate your probability based on the normal distribution instead of calculating it exactly with the binomial distribution? Well, we mentioned that n should be large, but it's also a little bit related to what the probabilities are because, of course, that affects their distribution. So there's many ways to ascertain whether it's good enough. It might just be that your question asks you to do it, so you'll say, okay, that's a good enough reason. But one rule of thumb is that if NP and NQ are both greater than 5, then your answer is going to be close enough that you may as well do it the normal way, which most times is going to be a lot easier. So in that last example, we found that N was 20, and both P and Q were a half. So 10, definitely bigger than 5, it was quite acceptable to do it and we saw that the answer in fact was really close no matter which method we used. Now the other really important consideration that you need to write down and consider every single time is that normal distributions are based on continuous data whereas binomial distributions are based on discrete data. So anytime we are using these to approximate those we have to use that continuity correction to account for this and that means considering the histogram and the polygon like we did in the last example consider the width of that one that we're using as the cutoff and know that we might need to go half a unit to one side or the other when we're finding the probability of x being inside a given interval. 
So in the first couple of examples, just make sure you're marking your work each time to check that you're using that continuity correction correctly because that's really the only tricky part um, in this topic. Other than that, you'll be finding mean and standard deviation um, of your distributions, which you already did in the last exercise. So those steps should be fairly straightforward.